I'm Tom Dumke. I'd like to welcome you to Thomas William Furniture Behind the Scenes Virtual Art Fair. I would like to introduce to you our host, Ned Wicker. Hello, Ned. Thank you for visiting us on day two of the Thomas William Furniture Virtual Art Fair. Today, we're gonna to go out to Hannibal, Missouri and meet acrylic painter, Melissa Dominiak. Then it's off to Santa Fe, New Mexico, and a wonderful clay sculptor and potter, Jack Charney. Then we're going to be visiting with Leah Evans out in Madison, Wisconsin, and her textile artwork. So relax, have a good time. Hannibal, Missouri, on the banks of the Mississippi River. For literary fans, Hannibal is the birthplace of Samuel Clemens. You might know him better by his pen name, Mark Twain. This impressive building is a place where Melissa Dominiac creates her stunning acrylic paintings. Now you're in for a treat, so let's go in and meet her. Hi, Melissa. Hi, Ned. We're used to seeing you at all the art fairs around the country, but it's nice to get a look behind the scenes. Thanks for letting us in. Thank you. I think we'll start by uh, asking a little bit about your current body of work and anything new that you've been working on. Sure. Um, I'll start with my current body of work. They are acrylic paintings on stretched canvas. I call them my life stills. I've been doing this body of work for about three or four years. And what I'm doing is I'm taking normal everyday things that we're surrounded by and I'm painting them visually to try to evoke some peace and quiet and some tranquility. I'm trying to slow us all down by appreciating the simplicity of what we have in front of us. I use antique frames on about 50% of my work. And then the other 50%, I don't frame at all. They are on thicker canvases. The edges are painted and nice and clean. So they don't need a frame. So they have a more contemporary feel to them. Um, I like formatting my canvases in fun ways, catching the objects differently through that. I like doing compositions on more than one canvas. There is a triptych right there as an example. So yeah. So. I am going off in a bit of a different direction recently where I am starting to focus more on the objects themselves. Uh, I'll, I'll use books as an example. Um, I'm working with shapes and forms and geometries. I think for many reasons, books kind of fit that bill. I'm 
formatting my canvases in a way that I'm using negative space to make the composition more about the actual objects. So I'm capturing that three dimension in perspective, which is what I really like to do also. So as an example, um, you can see coming up that I recently acquired a set of encyclopedias. I found them at an antique store recently. And my first thought, that's the last thing I want to bring home is a set of encyclopedias. But I couldn't resist them because of their size. And there's a lot of them. So I will have a lot of inspiration, um, the color of them, the texture. So that is the first painting I've done with them. And there will be many more to follow. It, it almost looks like you could reach out and pick one of them off the shelf. Yes, that's that's what I'm trying to achieve visually, some dimension, bring viewers in. It's amazing how styles uh, evolve. You know, you go from I I really like your 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 paintings of the blouses, for example, and then and then you go to the bucket uh, of you know without the water, and then you go to the books and. Uh, it, 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 it's just interesting how things uh, progress. Now, you, the building that you're in is in and of itself is really fascinating to me. Tell, tell us about that. Maybe you can take us around. Thank you. Um, yes, this is my studio space. I call it the Great Room Design House. It was built in 1890 as the first congregational church. I read that it wasn't used for very long as a church as the congregation went bankrupt soon after building it. I have a couple different uses within that 115 year time span. Um, it was a lodge for a group called the Knights of the Pythias. Um, it was a Pentecostal church. And the most recent use was the government had come in and they had officized it, basically. They were running a Head Start program out of it. So everything that you see, all the woodwork, all the vaults, they were hidden under a lowered ceiling. All the woodwork, um, there, were, there were office spaces constructed around the perimeter of the space. There were cubicles down the middle. There was carpet on the floor. So after it was all demoed out, what you're seeing now is pretty much what was there. So fortunately, they also updated electrical plumbing um, and took, took care in preserving the woodwork. So there wasn't really any damage, um, anything that really needed any immediate attention. A nice artistic setting for an artist. I like the stained glass. I love the woodwork. It's just a, a place where uh, you can kind of collect your thoughts and uh, let the creative process take over. Absolutely. Um, it's sort of, uh, the space is what is now inspiring what I'm doing within it. And I'm using my collection of things as an example. I can start with a fan collection that I've had for many I years. I love the fans. Thank you. Um, it's the first thing I've actually built in the space. It's a 14 and a half foot high shelf that uh, the shelves are um, spaced to hold the different size fans. Um, as I also have started more recently to paint the the taken on the monumental task of painting the walls. So when I started that, I also acquired some mannequins at the same time. So my first painting project was I painted one of the mannequins in the same color palette and wanted to make her look like she was walking out of the wall. And I absolutely love the scale of that. I love how it turned out. Um, you know, her, her size compared to the window next to her. However, I do have more mannequins and I intend on finding more mannequins. So that's just a, an example of how that process will unfold. So um, this is a quick jump to 
some other artistic endeavors that I do. Um, I like to think I use a different part of my brain um, working on this stuff. I build small pieces of furniture. I do some upholstery. I do a little bit of sewing and I paint flower pops and I have an Etsy shop that I sell this stuff on. And I would like to point out that everything I've done so far have all been with things that I have accumulated in the space. I haven't really gone out like the furniture I have built out of elements that I, I have found. Um, so now you can see how I'm starting to extend the painting into the interior walls of the church. And as another example, I had this group of old screens that I wanted to use to display my paintings. And in the meantime, while I was working on that, I was taking apart an old metal cot that was up in the attic of my house. And my house is as old as this building, so it was probably up there for a while. But I'm using the springs to suspend the screens and the screens will inspire the painting that is hanging from them. It will inspire the size. Um, as another example, I'm obsessed with bird's nests. So I'm building a, a tree and I'll be painting it. And as it fills out, the color will be coming down from, from the walls of the church visually. And I'll also be using it to display my bird's nest. And I will also have paintings of bird's nests. That is amazing how you how you take the mundane, how you take something that isn't uh, in and of itself particularly interesting, but you make it captivating. It's amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think just sum everything up. It, it's the interplay of of the space I'm working in, the objects, and my artwork, and it's the interplay of all of them together. It's an unfolding process. I have no real plan as to an end goal, and that's what's keeping me going. So I do own this building by myself. So that in itself is this monumental challenge every day. I like to, um, sometimes I refer to the building as my very large wayward child. Um, <laughs> so... <laughs> It, it's, it's a challenge, but it's a challenge that I have learned to meet with creativity. Oh, wow. Well, I, I really appreciate you letting us in and letting us take a look around and, and uh, showing us your collection. Now, before we let you go, Melissa, how, what's the best way for people to get a hold of you? Um, I can be contacted through my website, uh, uh, greatroomdesignhouse.com. The, the, um, Paintings that I showed at the beginning are all on my website. If there's anything that anybody has seen in the video that they would uh, have any kind of questions about, I can be contacted through the site. Well, hopefully in the future, when the art fairs uh, get going again, uh, folks will get a chance to come by and, and, and meet you. But for now, it's just been a delight talking to you. Thank you for your time and all the best. Thank you, Ned. Thank you for joining us on our Thomas William Furniture Virtual Art Fair Behind the Scenes. And we invite you to visit the site and see some of the other artists on the tour. When Jack Charney was 15 years old, a couple of art teachers changed his life. They put clay into his hands. A new world opened up. The clay provided a path for everything he wanted to do in life. It's more than the artistic process. It is life. The clay pushes him on, and he's found fulfillment and joy in creating his artwork from his shop in Santa Fe, New Mexico. We've been invited in for a close, personal, behind-the-scenes look at his world. Jack... Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to meet you. Hi, Ned. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Welcome to my world. We are excited to take a look around, but I understand that your beginnings in art was as a poet, and you have something to share. 
Yes, I do. Um, poetry allowed me to find my inner space as an artist. Study the salmon, the way they returned home to die. Study the heart, which should never be seen but heard and felt. Study the alpine lake that reflects the beauty of the azure sky. Study the sky, the imperative of rain and snow. Study the oceans, mother of all that is wet. Study wetness, handmaiden of evolution. Study the suffering commonness of most stones, of most people. Study your blind dog for how she still sees, her nose knowing the ghosts of everything she has smelled. Study the wind for its going ever on, through and around everything, somewhere. Study somewhere, a new space, a new place on the map, a country where the mundane utterances of a language sounds like music. Study going as a desire and movement as a need. Study the way red always moves towards you, threatening, blood-like, in love. Study swans and how they defend their young. Ask what it means to mate forever. Study fingers reaching and toes spreading. Study the way hair fractals into curls and relates to the rivulets of running water. Study your children, the downy-haired sweetness of them, for the good you have done. Notice how they wear your mistakes like full advertisements. Acknowledge the ones who invented domes, stairways, balusters, arches, and columns. Admire buildings. Study stars and know distance, then know time always passing, and time to know beginnings, and beginnings to know loneliness, and loneliness to know the drive of the salmon, to return, to get back home, to die surrounded by what really matters. Home as home, a place, a people people, a feeling, and time as change, home as life, always coming to. Thank you so much. That's a wonderful way to start our conversation because it really does speak to the heart of an artist. I notice that you do a variety of works in clay. A lot of your work is more sculptural than pottery. Do you call yourself a potter? I, I do. I, I, you know, I started off as a potter and the, the potter's way um, taught me to expand uh, as an artist and want to do different things with the whole tradition of what clay is and what clay offers. Now, moving into the sculptural pieces, uh, it reminds me of yoga or gymnasts. Where did that idea come from? Well, the figurative pieces originated when I was uh, in grad school and uh, trying to push myself. It also uh, relates to my travels in South America and the Mesoamerican figurines that I saw of the Aztec and the Mayans. And so I wanted to take that and expand on that. I also um, do a lot of yoga and I enjoy the way that my figures uh, connect with people in different ways, yoga, dancers, gymnasts, etc. I love your horse pieces. They have more detail than a lot of your other sculptures, and they seem to be telling a story. What was the inspiration behind that? When I started traveling in Asia, I came upon the Tang Dynasty horses, and I was really taken by them, the glazing, um, and, uh, you know, the the... The, using the horse as a vehicle. Now remember the, the Tang horses were war horses. What I'm trying to do is add an iconography of imagery to that to create a, a poem of sorts, a yin yang poem, a pulling of opposites. Um, and so I want the, the, the more peaceful imagery to tame the, the aggressive energy of the horse. You grew up in Spain. And as a child, uh, that sort of developed your sense of color and design. And uh, talk about that and the impact that it's had on you as an artist. Well, as a young child, um, you know, I, I, I thought that the world was all about, you know, that light of the Mediterranean, uh, that use of color and design in just everyday objects, um, you know, making uh, every meal uh, a bowl, a plate. Uh, you know, uh, a celebration. You, you mentioned, you know, all the travels. Now, you're growing up in Spain, you've been all over the world, and you seem to draw on everything as inspiration. Well, it's true. Uh, I, I, you know, traveling around, uh, 
you know, going do, doing art shows, uh, sometimes I can get very worn out. I look forward to the time in December and January, which is my downtime, to go somewhere and see and experience a whole new culture and a, and a whole new type of folk, you know, folk, work, folk art traditions really interest me. And, and those traditions that are dying out. And can I learn something and use that in my work and, and keep it going forward? I, I see that you know, your work has changed in, in some of your more recent works. You've gotten off the horse, so to speak. And what can you tell us about this new body of work? Well, the boat pieces are, I call Gone to Land. And they're about this time, now you know, the time of the virus and us being inside in our homes and the importance of finding who our family and friends are and what's important to us as individuals. Has it, has it been hard for you to be at home and not around the country seeing people? Not at all. You know, if anything, uh, being at home and in my studio has allowed me to reflect on things that I've maybe put aside over the years, you know, because of, you know, uh, all of the moving about and getting ready for shows and, you know, having to be across the country and all the things I, I started noticing things that I, I started and put aside and, and, and going, going back to those pieces and, you know, having the time to reflect and find what I needed to do to finish those has been a, you know, has, has been, a really great thing. My eyes have been kind of glued on the artwork behind you. Tell us about that. Well, the drawings I started to do when I, you know, in my travels, because I, I a lot of times, you know, you're in the room, um, you know, I can't like sit on a beach and, and burn myself all the time. And uh, <laughs> I, I, you know, I need to, you know, there, it was something else I needed to do and I think of them as my most intuitive work. And um, I, I don't sell them, so there's no market value that's driving them. It's totally something for myself to be expressive. And this time, it is, you know, uh, I have the time to put into these drawings and really concentrate on them. Any, uh, anything you'd like to add here? It's, it's just been a joy talking to you. You've done so much. And, and where, do you, where do you think your, uh, your artwork is going to go in the years ahead? Well, um, if, I, if I could, I would do more writing. Uh, I have a couple mm -hmm. ideas for screenplays. Um, I would like to publish something. Um, and, um, you know, that's what I would like to do. <laughs> oh, um, new new horizons. <laughs> I don't what? I don't think I'll I don't think I'll give up the clay though. I need to, <laughs> you know, my, yeah, well that that seems to be your, your your life's passion. One of my friends said, Jack, you're more than a kiln. <laughs> and uh, I had to think about that for a while, but you know. What's the uh, what's the best way for folks to get a hold of you? I do have a website, jackcharney.com. Uh, uh, do Facebook or, or the other, uh, the Zuckerberg uh, means of communication. Uh, uh, but I, uh, you could also call me 505-570-1035. And um, I would look forward to anybody who wants to communicate with me or, or is interested in my work. Well, I know you want to get your hands back in the clay, so we're going to let you get back to work. But thank you so much for letting us in and sharing some of your heart with us. Well, thank you also and enjoyed it. We thank you for watching this Thomas William Furniture virtual art fair behind the scenes. And we welcome you to visit the other artists on the tour. In Leah Evans' world, there's no such thing as just another wall hanging. It's not a quilt, it's a statement. Her pieces are influenced by aerial photography, 
maps satellite imagery, but they're not always based on specific places. There's also an environmental theme to Leah's work, giving it depth and importance. She creates her art in Madison, Wisconsin. Let's go behind the scenes and learn the driving force behind this fine collection. Hi, Leah. Hi, Ned. Well, I appreciate you letting us come in and visit with you, and maybe you could take us around and talk about your workspace. Sure. So just outside my workspace, I keep a, in the yard, I keep a flower garden with daisies, lilies, spiderwort, and irises. My space looks out onto a popular Madison bike path. While ironing, I notice people passing by, and in the warm months, I hear birds and children. Working from home has its benefits, especially while raising young children. My daughters, Netta and Wren, sometimes share the space with me while they play or work on their own projects. I can easily pop into the studio for a short spell in between our daily schedules. My studio is very small. I have one table for ironing and laying out work and materials, and one table for my Kenmore sewing machine. It's a basic home model machine that I've used for 20 years. My grandmother gave it to me when I graduated from college. It works great for me because I don't rely on any programmable or computerized sewing equipment. We'd love to have a look at some of your recent work. Maybe you can show us a few pieces. Yeah, I recently set up a condensed version of my art fair booth. So there's a lot of variety in scale. All the pieces are inspired by maps and satellite imagery or aerial photography. Most pieces explore or address a type of land use or some interaction between people and land. These are my small pieces, which typically have colorful hand-dyed scraps of fabric and small stitch details. The frames are made of paper mache and they make nice groupings for small wall spaces, like between doors and windows in old houses like mine. This piece titled Delta represents my medium scale work. They're framed in poplar or maple shadow boxes and appear to float in the frame. I like working at this scale, 12 inches by 12 inches because it allows me to include a lot of detail and handwork. My larger free hanging pieces come with a mounting strip and it's easily nailed or screwed into the wall and the pieces attached with Velcro. Where do you get the inspiration for your pieces? Um, I look to a lot of different sources for inspiration. Sometimes it's reading an article about a certain type of land use. Sometimes it's an image that I stumble upon and do more research. This piece I call Hydroglyphs 2. It's part of a two piece uh, section that um, I, the, the initial inspiration was looking at burial mounds and thinking of our legacy, what we might leave behind that cultures will ponder in the future. So what I did for this piece was gathered as many artificially, man, artificially shaped bodies of water. So man-made bodies of water in Florida around residential areas. Um, some, there's some man-made islands in Dubai and marinas and kind of focused on playing with all that imagery together. And the next piece is called Satellite. And again, I was looking at um, satellite imagery of irrigated farmland. So all these patterns were similar to images I'd seen. And I kind of took some of the imagery and changed the colors and played with it and came up with this really intricate piece. The next one is based on a real place in Dubai um, called the World Archipelago. So the, the initial inspiration for it was reading an article called The World is Sinking. So it was about these man-made islands in the shape of the world, a map of the world that were built and then the development stalled and these islands were sinking back into the sea before anything was built on them. So for me, it was a metaphor 
for climate change and sea levels rising and also this monument to wealth and excess. There's an awful lot going on with your with your artwork. Uh, what are some of the major, uh, the main techniques you use in your process? Um, I have some video that shows me um, stitching. So I spend about a third of my time at the sewing machine. After hand drawing onto the fabric where I plan to be stitching, I stitch over those lines and because I don't use a long arm machine, it looks a bit cumbersome. I also use my machine a lot for piecing fabric, using simple stitches for design elements and quilting layers together. In this video, I'm stitching layers together for reverse applique. The technique of reverse applique can be done by hand, layering fabric, cutting sections off the top and carefully folding raw edges under to be stitched out of sight. They can also be done on the machine with machine stitching. After stitching the outlines of the shapes I want, I then take scissors and hand cut away the extra fabric on the outside of the shape. The cutting is tedious, time consuming, and sometimes unforgiving. And we've sped this video up because it's also a bit slow and boring. It takes a lot of practice not to cut through too many layers or to cut the machine stitches. It, it's also hard on my hands and I deal with carpal tunnel and wear and tear arthritis. But despite that, I love this technique and the freedom it gives me. The shapes can be slender and organic. I can keep adding layers of reverse applique to create more depth and detail. The subtractive quality of the technique mimics erosion, which feeds nicely into pieces that are based on water. This particular piece is based on contour farming in the Driftless area of Wisconsin. The techniques of piecing, reverse applique, and machine embroidery are combined to show patterns and property divisions. All of my quilts combine several techniques. The last step is almost always um, hand embroidery. So showing symbols and markers that encourage questions. And part of my love of maps is looking at them and puzzling about what all the details mean. And then Go ahead, Ned. No, I, I was just looking at the, There's so much going on, Leah. Where do you go to get your materials to put all this together? Yeah, I. that's also a big time-consuming endeavor. I have about 70% salvage materials in my pieces. And this video shows me processing linen fabric from a pair of pants that I bought at a thrift store. My favorite local place to go sell clothing cast-offs from secondhand stores. So basically the stuff they get that they just can't sell, the volume and the quality just doesn't allow it. Um, this, and they also sell by the pound. So I go there, find the materials I need, wash them, take them apart. Um, and that can be pretty time consuming, but the raw material is super inexpensive and keeps something out of a landfill. I also use upholstery remnants. This video shows linen fabric that is all from garments that I've repurposed. I also use upholstery scraps and scraps from other dyers um, and mostly natural fibers. Here I am using those pieces from a garments or sometimes commercial prints that I over dye and I'm working in my basement dyeing those with fiber reactive dyes. Um, and because I'm open to spending all this time taking, taking everything apart um, and also using small scraps, uh, it kind of, it saves me saves me the time and I guess the money that I'd be spending on new materials. Wow. Where do people go to, to see your work and to, and, and to purchase a piece for themselves? Yeah, I keep my website um, pretty current on the larger pieces. So you can see available work there. And then I also have links to an Etsy site. Um, my shop is Leah Evans Textile, so it's the same as my website that's on Etsy and then also on Instagram and Facebook. Uh, Leah Evans Textiles is the name I use there too. So I can post smaller things there 
and just keep people updated on what I'm working on, what shows I'll be doing when we start doing shows again. Um, and just, yeah, that's where they can follow me. Before I let you go, I have, I, I'm really curious, where do you think your work is going in the years ahead? Yeah, I, I'm really pushing for more involved stories about land use. And I, I pull from historical context and historical maps and issues that we're dealing with now. Um, I'm really excited about working with imagery of volcanoes. I went to Hawaii last summer and spent some time at Volcanoes National Park. And I'd like to keep pursuing pieces about human interaction with volcanoes. Now that is something I would look forward to seeing. <laughs> Leah, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us and showing us around. Thank you, Ned, it's been great. And we wanna thank you for watching this Thomas William Furniture Virtual Art Fair behind the scenes. And we welcome you to check out all the other artists on the tour.